Ready for a deep dive into the world of global talent? We're not just talking about hiring someone overseas. It's way more than that. It's about really understanding what it takes to find, prepare, and support employees in a world that's you know, totally globalized. It's like globalization is the backbone of how businesses work now, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And you know we love to dig deeper here. Always. Our source material today, chapter 17.pdf, gets into all the academic nitty-gritty of managing talent internationally. So get ready for some serious aha moments about what it takes to really thrive in a global workplace these days. Because it's not as simple as like knowing the right handshake anymore. Definitely not. We're talking about navigating cultural differences, understanding global mindsets, the whole shebang. You've got to know people just as well as you know the market, right? I'm going to agree more. So let's kick things off with this idea that globalization is old news. Sure, the pandemic shook things up, but... It kind of threw a wrench in the physical movement of, well, everything. Right. But it also launched international data sharing into hyperdrive. Yep. Think banking, engineering, all that information. The digital world just exploded. It's kind of ironic when you think about it. You'd think a global pandemic would make everyone like retreat inwards, but it forced us to find new ways to connect. Exactly. And get this Zoom, that video conferencing tool yeah. everyone uses. Over 800 million people use it globally every single month. Wow. Which tells you just how crucial it is to be culturally intelligent these days even online. Those numbers are mind-blowing. Okay, but here's the thing. Even with all this interconnectivity, cultural differences are here to stay. Oh, absolutely. In fact, they're even more important in today's global workplace. It's a mistake to think technology just magically erases those differences. If anything, it kind of highlights them. You yeah, know, totally. Different cultures have different norms, ways of communicating, even online. Exactly. Which brings us to the idea of tight versus loose cultures, a mm. key concept from the chapter. Think about a country like Japan, a classic example of a tight culture. Strong social norms, a very clear right way of doing things. And then you contrast that with the U.S., which is often considered a more loose culture, right? right yeah. Fewer explicit rules, more emphasis on individual expression. For sure. And of course, these are just two examples on a spectrum. Of course, it's not black and white. Exactly. Yeah. But imagine trying to navigate a work deal with someone from a tight culture if you're coming from a loose one. Oh, the potential for miscommunication is huge. Exactly. And that's where cultural intelligence or a CQ comes into play. It's all about being aware of those differences and adapting your behavior to be effective in those different contexts. So important. And it's a skill you can develop. It's not like you're born with it or anything. Yeah. And believe me, it makes a world of difference in a global workplace. Speaking of decoding cultures, the chapter gets into Hofstede's cultural dimensions. Now, I know this might sound a bit academic, but trust me, it's incredibly useful. Hostede basically identified five key dimensions of cultural variation that can really impact how we work together. It's fascinating stuff, really. You've got power distance, which is all about how comfortable people are with hierarchy. Right, like are decisions made top down or is it more collaborative? Exactly. And think about the implications for giving feedback or suggesting new ideas. It totally changes how you approach those conversations. Then there's uncertainty avoidance, which is how comfortable a culture is with, well, uncertainty, right? Right, like high uncertainty avoidance. You can bet there are going to be lots of rules in the structure. Low, it's more go with the flow, more flexibility. So different. Imagine you're leading a team with people from both high and low uncertainty avoidance cultures. Planning a project would be, well. It would require a very nuanced approach to make sure everyone's on the same page. Absolutely. It's almost like speaking different work languages. OK, next up. Individualism versus collectivism. This one is huge E in the workplace. Individualistic cultures, it's all about those individual goals and achievements. But in collectivist cultures, it's the group's success that takes priority. It makes you think about things like brainstorming sessions. Totally. In a very individualistic culture, you might have a lot of people pitching their own ideas. Yeah. Right? But in a more collectivist setting, the focus might be more on building consensus and finding solutions that benefit the whole team. So interesting how those dynamics play out in different cultures. OK, so we've got power distance, uncertainty, avoidance, individualism versus collectivism. What's next? Masculinity versus femininity, right? That's right. And don't let the names throw you off. This isn't about gender roles. It's really about cultural values. Oh, exactly. So masculine cultures, they really value achievement, competition, 
assertiveness. Right, go-getters. Yeah. Whereas feminine cultures, they prioritize cooperation, quality of life, those strong relationships. And it influences things like communication styles, too. For sure. Like, in a more masculine culture, direct, assertive communication, that's seen as confident and effective. But in a more feminine culture, it could be perceived as aggressive. Again, nuance is everything. And lastly, we have long-term versus short-term orientation. This one is all about a culture's relationship with time. Right. Long-term thinking. It's all about planning for the future, maybe delaying gratification now for bigger rewards down the line. And short-term, it's about living in the now, those immediate results. Exactly. So in a long-term oriented culture, you might see more emphasis on employee training and development, you know, really investing in the future of the workforce. But in a more short-term oriented culture, it might be more about hitting those immediate targets and goals. These dimensions are like having a cultural roadmap to the workplace. They help you understand why people approach work differently and, most importantly, how to bridge those cultural gaps. And it's not about saying one way is right or wrong. It's about having that awareness and adapting your approach to create a work environment that's more harmonious and productive for everyone. It's almost like you've got this cultural decoder ring. You know, you can start to see the world through all these different lenses and understand why people approach work the way they do. It's definitely about more than just knowing the cultural facts. So much more. This chapter really gets into what it takes to build those, you know, those sought after international executive skills. Because it's not something you just pick up overnight, right? It's a process, for sure. It starts with getting noticed, but not by being the loudest one in the room. It's deeper than that. Right. Think about demonstrating sharp insights, broad business knowledge, that kind of thing, and rock solid integrity. Basically, be someone people want to invest in. Exactly. And once you've got their attention, you've got to become a learning machine. Always seeking out those growth opportunities, embracing those cultural adventures, even if they're a little outside your comfort zone. Because that's where the real growth happens. And seeking out feedback, even when it's tough to hear. And it's not just about hearing it. It's about actually internalizing it. Being open to criticism, understanding where it's coming from, and being willing to admit when you don't have all the answers. Which could be tough. There's a lot of humility involved in that, isn't there? It's so easy to get defensive when someone critiques our work. But in a global setting, that can be a real roadblock. For sure. And then all that learning, it needs to turn into actual change. Right. You've got to walk the walk. Exactly. Yeah. Successful international executives are adaptable, constantly evolving those skills and incorporating new perspectives into the way they work. Lifelong learners, always evolving. That's the key. And this ties directly into what the chapter calls cultural competence, which is that ability to really be effective in these diverse cultural settings. And you know what? The research backs this up. It's not just a buzzword. It's legit. Studies show a strong link between cultural intelligence and like better performance in those international roles, smoother communication, and adapting more easily to new cultures. It's like unlocking a secret level of success in the global workplace. That's a great way to put it. Okay, but then it gets into this idea of how we choose the right people for these international assignments in the first place. And it's not just about having the right passport. Right it's there. so much more than that. It goes way beyond just like having the right technical skills. Because someone could be amazing at their job in one country. But a total flop in another. Exactly. Personality is huge here. The chapter talks about those big five personality traits, openness conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And some are more important for international success than others. For sure. For example, imagine you need someone to build relationships with clients in a brand new country. Extroversion and agreeableness. Huge assets in that situation. Being able to connect with people, navigate those initial cultural differences, it can make or break the deal. It's about building trust, that human connection. And then there's conscientiousness. International work can be pretty ambiguous, right? So being organized, responsible, staying on top of things, those are crucial skills. Absolutely. And we can't forget about openness, right? Being curious about the culture, being open to trying new things, different perspectives. Those are the things that set people up to really thrive in a new cultural setting. It's about embracing the adventure. But here's something interesting. The chapter says those ideal personality traits, they can actually change depending on the type of assignment. Which makes sense when you think about it. Right. Someone going in for like a short-term, highly technical role, they're not going to need the same level of, say, extroversion as someone who's tasked with 
building those deep relationships with stakeholders. It's about finding the right person for the role, but also the right role for the person. And that's where this in-depth job analysis comes in, which the chapter says a lot of companies don't do well. It's more common than you think. There's this assumption that a job is the same everywhere. Right, like a job title is a job title. Exactly. But the reality is that same job title, it can have totally different responsibilities and demands depending on the culture, the company's global strategy, you name it. So you could have someone who's killing it in one country, but they totally bomb in another because the expectations are different. Exactly. And that's why this like really thorough job analysis is so crucial. Companies have got to invest the time to really understand what success looks like in that specific international context. What are the skills, the knowledge, the personality traits that are really going to allow someone to thrive? It's about understanding those nuances, not just checking boxes. Okay, so you found the right person, you've got the role crystal clear, then what? The prep work. Right, you've got to get them ready. Cross-cultural training, which is way more than just a quick PowerPoint on local customs. It's got to be more than that, right? Oh, absolutely. This is where companies can really make a difference in setting their people up for success. The chapter talks about three key areas, cultural awareness, behavioral training, and then just the practical day-to-day -day stuff. Okay, so let's break that down. Cultural awareness, that makes sense, understanding the values, beliefs, customs of that host country. But what does behavioral training involve? It's like taking that cultural knowledge and making it actionable. So it's not enough to just know the customs. It's about actually practicing the behaviors that will help you thrive in that culture. Exactly. It's about building those like cultural reflexes so you're not constantly second guessing yourself in every interaction. You're just in the flow. Right. And then there's that practical stuff I mentioned. Yeah. Navigating public transport, finding housing, even knowing how to like grocery shop in a new place. They seem like small things. But they can make a huge difference if you're stressed about those everyday things. It impacts everything. It can really impact how well and how quickly employees adjust. Totally. The chapter mentioned this training method called a cultural assimilator. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, it's actually a really cool method that uses like real life scenarios to help people understand and respond to cultural differences. So let's say you're about to start a new job in, I don't know, Japan. The cultural assimilator might put you in a situation where you have to disagree with your boss, which we know can be really tricky in a more hierarchical culture. Right. And then you're given different options for how to handle it. And depending on what you choose, you get feedback on whether your approach was culturally appropriate or not. It's a really interactive, engaging way to learn. Kind of like those choose your own adventure books, but for cultural competence. I love it. Exactly. And the best part, the research shows it works. Studies have found that using cultural assimilators can lead to smoother cross-cultural adjustment, better job performance, even improved language skills. That's amazing. Okay, so we've talked about selecting the right people, giving them the tools to succeed, but how do we measure that success? Performance management, which I'm guessing gets even more complex in these international contexts. It definitely adds another layer of complexity. Because what flies in one country might not in another, right? Exactly. The challenge is to create a system that's both fair and culturally sensitive because what's considered like stellar performance in one culture might not be seen the same way in another. You can't just take a performance management system from one country and plop it down in a different part of the world and expect it to work. Not a chance. You got to factor in the local context. How is feedback usually given? How are different communication styles perceived? How is performance even defined and measured in that culture? You need that balance, right? Like having some global standards, but also making sure you're being sensitive to those local differences. Absolutely. And it goes beyond just the metrics themselves. It's about how that feedback is delivered. Oh, for sure. In some cultures, giving super direct feedback is totally normal, expected even. But in others, it could be seen as rude or disrespectful. It's like that saying, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, but on a global scale. Exactly. You really have to understand the cultural context and adapt your communication style accordingly. So important. And this is something that should be like a key part of those 
cross-cultural training programs, right? 100%. Mm -hmm. Preparing employees for those subtle communication differences can make a world of difference in their experience and how well they perform. It's all about giving them the tools and the knowledge to navigate that new world successfully. Exactly. And speaking of transitions, we can't talk about these international assignments without talking about repatriation. Right, that whole process of coming home after working abroad. Which can be tough. It's a bigger adjustment than a lot of companies realize. Because those employees, they've often changed, sometimes a lot, during their time away. They've had all these new experiences. Exactly. And they might find that their perspectives don't really line up with their colleagues back home anymore. It's that whole reverse culture shock thing. It's like you come back from this amazing trip and suddenly your everyday life feels strange. I've totally been there. So how can companies help their employees through that process? Well, Chapter 17 breaks it down into three main areas. Planning career management, and compensation. Okay, so it starts with having a plan. This isn't something you figure out after the fact. Exactly. That repatriation conversation, it needs to happen way up front, ideally when someone's first considering that international assignment. It's all about setting those expectations from the get-go, both for the employee and the company. Exactly. Asking those important questions early on. What happens after the assignment is over? What role are they coming back to? Are there even opportunities for them to use those new global skills? Exactly. And that leads right into career management because employees who've gone through that international experience, they need to feel like it was valuable, like it wasn't just a sidetrack in their career path. They need to see a future, opportunities for growth, in roles where their global experience is a real asset. Otherwise, they're going to start looking for those opportunities somewhere else. Which makes sense. The last thing a company wants is to invest all this time and energy in developing these amazing, globally competent employees. And then lose them because they don't feel valued when they come home. Exactly. It's about making them feel like they're really coming back home, not starting over from scratch. Totally. And then there's the whole money side of things. Compensation. Right? Which can be a big deal. It's often overlooked, but it's so important. Because you have to remember, a lot of these repatriated employees, they might have been getting those cost of living adjustments overseas or other perks. Right, like a housing allowance or something. Exactly. So coming back, it could be a financial shock. Like going from fancy dinners every night to ramen noodles. Basically. Yeah. So companies really need to be aware of that potential financial hit and provide the right support, whether it's a repatriation bonus help with those housing costs, even just some financial counseling to help them adjust to their home country's cost of living again. It's about acknowledging the challenges they might face and giving them the resources they need to get back on their feet. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked a lot about cultural intelligence, and it's important to remember it's not like you have it or you don't. It's something you can build on over time, right? It's like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. Mm. And there are tons of ways to strengthen those cultural intelligence muscles. Absolutely. Like traveling is the obvious one. Even if it's just a vacation, immersing yourself in a different culture, even for a short time, it can really open your eyes. Totally. And you don't even have to get on a plane. You can explore different cultural communities right in your own city. There are always cultural events happening. Exactly. Go to those festivals, check out restaurants with cuisines from around the world, even just like striking up conversations with people from different backgrounds. Those everyday interactions can teach you so much. They really can. And hey, reading books or watching films from different cultures, that's another great way to broaden those horizons. A hundred percent. And don't just stick with what you know. Challenge yourself a bit. Exactly. Pick a genre you wouldn't normally go for. Yeah. You might be surprised what you discover. It's all about challenging those assumptions, you know? Opening yourself up to new ways of looking at the world. Exactly. And then, of course, actually having those opportunities to work with people from different backgrounds. Invaluable. It's the best way to learn. Maybe volunteer with an organization that serves a diverse community or join a professional group focused on international business, something like that. Every experience, every interaction, it all adds to those cultural intelligence skills. For sure. Wow. We've really covered a lot of ground in this deep dive. From the big picture of how globalization is changing how we work, all the way to those specific strategies for selecting, training, and supporting employees in a globalized workplace. We talked about navigating cultural differences, why that in-depth job analysis is so important, those challenges of performance management across cultures, and even those repatriation pieces that often get overlooked. It's a lot to take in, but hopefully you're walking away with some new insights and a fresh perspective on how important cultural competence is these days. Because at the end of the day, international talent management 
It's not about HR policies and procedures. It's about people. It's about building workplaces where people from all different backgrounds can thrive. It's about recognizing the unique skills and perspectives that every single person can bring to the table and creating an environment that celebrates those differences. It's about building bridges, fostering understanding, and really embracing the richness and diversity of our world. And that's a mission worth fighting for. So as you navigate your own career path, whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, remember that ability to connect with people from all walks of life, that is powerful. Be a citizen of the world, open, curious, always ready to learn and grow. This deep dive was created just for you based on the material you provided, and we're excited to see what fascinating topics you want to explore with us next. Until then, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep diving deep.